Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fight Addicts. Get ready to explore the past, present, and future of MMA with your hosts, Seth Oliver and Ben Korn. What's happening, guys? Welcome to episode number 24 of the Fight Addicts. This episode was recorded on August the 20th, 2019. So, for the month of September, Ben and I are going to do things a little bit different. International Podcast Day is September the 30th of this year, so Ben and I have decided to make the whole month of September International Podcast Month here at the Fight Addicts. What that means is that for each episode this month, we're going to connect with a host or co-host of another podcast in the same niche as us so that we can all grow and connect from each other. The only episodes in September that won't include people from another podcast are the first episode of the month, which is this one, and the last episode of the month. We have our biggest guest yet scheduled for the last episode of the month, and we feel it's the best way to end what's going to be a great month here. We're excited about it. We're thankful for all the guests that have agreed to join the show already, and we hope that you guys enjoy it as well. So to kick things off, I'm joined by UFC bantamweight Chris El Guapo Gutierrez in this episode, where he gives an update on his life after his win against Gerardo De Freitas at UFC Uruguay. Unfortunately for you guys, it's just me in this episode due to Ben being sick, but me and Chris still had a great time, and I'm excited for you guys to hear it. So let's kick off International Podcast Month with a great episode. Here's episode number 24 of The Fight Addicts. El Guapo, welcome back to the show, man. How's it going? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I appreciate it so much. So, you just had a recent fight in Montevideo, Uruguay. How did you like it out there? Man, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience. I've never been there. You know, I've never been to uh, Uruguay, but to, to be there and, uh, you know, that was the first show they've ever had there. So, we, you know, every fighter that fought that night, you know, we all made history and, uh, Man, it was nice. People were so amazing, and, and it was just a beautiful experience. Yeah. Now, whenever you're down there for a fight, like, did you go sightseeing or anything like that? Or is it pretty much uh, we, you're just kind of down there? Well, you know, throughout the week, you uh, you know, you got to take care of business. But, you know, you also want to get your, you know, because you're cutting weight, man. It's miserable. It really is. And um, So, you know, you get out and you see you see as much as you, you know, you, you can until, you know, you got to get back to the, to the hotel to get, get a sweat going or, you know, do some, do a little bit of, uh, you know, pad work and, and, and grappling, you know, everything. And, uh, but some, we, we got to, because our, our flight didn't leave till later, like way later that night. So Sunday we got up kind of early. We went to go eat breakfast as a, you know, as a team and, uh, and, uh, we got to go sightsee a little bit and it was pretty, man. We got to see some really nice things. We went to downtown, uh, Montevideo and, uh, it was beautiful. Gotcha. That's awesome. So you would go back in the future, like given the chance. Oh I d- yeah, I definitely would. I would definitely go back. It's beautiful, man. Gotcha. It, the one thing that did suck is it was like the starting of winter. And so we were not prepared for that. I, luckily, you know, the UFC gave us, you know, pretty big, uh, sweaters, but, um, yeah, it was cold. And then the hotel was right by the, uh, the water. So that cold breeze really, really messed with us a little bit. Yeah. I heard, uh, Dan Hardy cause he went on the Joe Rogan experience and he was talking about being down there and he did not expect it to be as cold as it was. So that was funny that you brought that up. Uh, it was, it was nice though, man. Overall it was a beautiful experience. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Now, do you watch fights? Like on your own, because I was going to ask you about UFC 241 this past weekend. If you watch the fights, oh, of course, yeah, I watched it. I had two teammates fighting on that card, right? Uh, Ian Heinich and uh, Devontae Smith. Yeah. So, what's it like being teammates with those guys and seeing them out there? Like, I'm sure that it adds a whole other level of like excitement and kind of thrill to it all. Watching them, and it's a beautiful thing, man. Because like we are. Uh, you know, we're all just humans, and um, man, you know, this is a dream that not a lot of people, you know, it's it's crazy, man, because, like, my whole life, my whole career, I was told that, you know, I wasn't going to make it, you know, and to a point, I believed it, and so, you know, my coach really shed some light on, on, on me and my, one of my teammates, Jonathan Martinez, the other day, uh, a couple of months back, um, you know, we doing some, you know, uh, 
uh, me and Jonathan were, you know, we were doing some stuff and and we got in trouble and, and Coach Mark was like, you know, do you realize who you guys are and what, what you guys do? You know, you guys are in the UFC. And then he was like, you got to think about it. How many people are there on this world, right? And he was like, how many people the UFC, you know, has on, you know, on, uh, on deck for fights? You know, how many people they contract? And it's like, it's like 500 fighters and all. But in your weight class alone, it's like 150. So think about it. How many people are there are in the world? Out of those 150, man, you're one of those. And man, that's that's a crazy, you know, percentage. Like that number is is very small, you know. And it's crazy because like I was told I was never going to amount to anything. And to be like, man, look where I'm at now, you know. It's a uh, it's a dream come true, honestly. Like I'm I'm truly blessed to be where I'm at. And then to see other people. You know, you're like, you know, I rub elbows with these guys. You know, we we chop it up all the time at the gym. We laugh. We go out, you know, to movies. We go out to eat. And like, Ian, you know, me and Ian, we go to church together on Saturdays. And it's like, man, this guy's the number 10 ranked middleweight in the world. And, you know, and, you know, to call him a friend, a brother, a teammate, man, it's, it's an honor. And it's just like so humbling to be like, wow, like, I can be the number 10 ranked guy in my division, you know, I could be the number one, I could be a champion. You know what I mean? For sure. So, so it's, it's, so it's nice to be able to, to be around these people that share the same ambition and goals as you. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I'm glad that you explained it like that. So headlining that card, Stipe Miocic, he gets the comeback victory and then the return of Nate Diaz. What'd you think about both of those things? Oh man. Anytime you see Nick D, uh, Nick and Nate fight, man, you know it's uh, it's going to be a fight. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, I love Nate Diaz because of you know how real he is. You know, he's 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 real, man. He's not going to like behind the you know behind the you know off cameras. He's not going to be a different person. You know, he's going to be legit. He's, he's real as is. And, yeah, and he's just a G straight up. He a G. So it's just, man. I love the you know the the. How do you say the authenticity of him? Like you know the realness. Yeah. It's not. It's not nothing fake. Like the guy lights up a a, a blunt for <laughs> the, the you know for the media workout. Like yeah. come on, man. Like and he said, like I would do that at the gym. I would do that before practice. Like I'm about to practice. I'm gonna do it right now to get my mind straight. So man, it's it's awesome. And the fact that he's he wants to fight you know Jorge Masvidal. It's crazy, man, because like I took a picture with with uh, Masvidal, and man, we got the we got to chop it up a little bit. I saw that on and, your Instagram. Um, I was going to ask you about that. Oh man, it was it was badass, man. You know, and it was kind of awesome because like we met in the in the elevator, and the elevator was kind of full. So like, I uh, I got in the elevator and uh, I was facing you know all of them, but everyone's cutting weight, so they're all looking, you know, down, and everybody's miserable, and <laughs> yeah. Jorge Masvidal just, like, locked eyes on me, and I locked eyes on him, and it was one of those, like, who's gonna bitch out and look down, so, uh, I guess I bitched out first, and I, you know, I looked down <laughs> a little bit, and then, and then I looked back at him, and he kept looking at me, and then I was like, all right, this time I'm not gonna back down, so I was like, damn, he's really staring at me, so I was like, you know, I nodded my head, like, what's up, he did the same thing, and then he kind of cracked a little smile, so I was like, "Good, he's not going to three piece me and give me a soda while he's doing it." You know? <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty cool, man. And we, you know, I got off the elevator, and of course, I was like, "Hey, man, can I get a picture?" And he was like, "Yeah." And you know, we got to talk, and you know, we got some things in common, actually. So, uh, you know, I don't want to put his business out there, but uh, you know, we got to talk about some personal stuff, and uh, it was nice, man. It was nice to know that uh, he's a real humble person. He, he really is, and uh, you know. Again, you know, to uh, to talk to somebody like that, it, it was pretty cool, you know? Yeah, I like Jorge because I was listening to his episode where he went on the Drogan experience today. He seems like a pretty cool guy, and I'd really like to have that chance that you had to meet him. Man, he's he's cool, man. I, I, he's just one of those people, like, he doesn't like stupid, you know, questions. He doesn't, <laughs> yeah, if you ask him a I can see question, that. He's going to... He's gonna, you know, he's going to put you in your place. He's going to tell you how dumb you are. And I like that, you know, I like that about him. And, you know, and like him and Nate now, they're trying to get that fight for, you know, you know, they, they're labeling the belt, right? Yeah. The, uh, the BMF belt, right? Yeah. The BMF belt. Man, that's so <laughs> badass. <laughs> yeah. And that's, well, some, that's the only something 
Nate can get away with. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Only a Diaz. So, go, going back to you and your fights, uh, like we opened it up with, you went to Uruguay, made history on that card, and you fought Gerardo de Freitas. So, after the first round, Michael Bisbing was on commentary, and he talked about what your coaches said to you after that round, which was that you need to control the center more, don't dance around the perimeter, that you had lost that round, and that you can't repeat what you did in that first round. Now, during the fight, did you feel like you had lost that first round? You know, it's sometimes, you know, you just got to, like, I understand, like, my coach was saying, fight down the mouthpiece and go, you know, and sometimes you got to, and I think, you know, I was dancing around the perimeter, you know, because that's my style. I move around a lot, and I, you know, I try to pick my shots and then go in for the kill. Well, the guy was just swinging wild, and, you know, he was, it was kind of like throwing me off a little bit because, like, he wasn't throwing technically was you know they say you brawl a you brawl a technical fighter and then you you strike technical against a brawler and whoever can can impose their will can usually get the, you know their the you know the their hand raised because if you make a brawler fight technical you usually pick him apart if you make a technical fighter brawl you usually pick him apart cuz you he's not used to that and so at times you know he would bring the dog fight you know and and he would you know, cause me to, you know, have to buckle, you know, bite down and, and bring out the dog in me for that. But, you know, I've done that before. You know, I, I have that in me. It's just, you know, I'm a technical person when it comes to fighting. Uh, at times, I can get, you know, I, you know, like I said, I let the dog out and let's do it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But, um, you know, it, it was a, um, you know, it was a give and take in, in that fight. I was dancing around trying to pick my shots, and when he was coming in recklessly, I was chopping his legs down and. Ultimately, I felt like I did the most damage. You know, I dropped him with leg kicks. I busted his nose. I controlled, uh, you know, the clinch work on the fence. He took me down, but I got right back up. And then, like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. he was controlling the perimeter, and he was running in recklessly. But he was also getting, you know, I was also uh, piecing him up, too. You know, I was touching him up a little bit with, you know, with him uh, coming in all reckless like that. Right. But, you know, the one thing that was kind of iffy was, um, the commission and the judges were Brazilian. And because Uruguay, from what I was told, Uruguay is so new to it that they don't have a commission yet. And so Uruguay borders were Brazil, so they just brought all of Brazil down. And I was like, man, shit, that sucks, you know? And yeah. I just, for the first time, I was like, you know what? I hope they judge it not based on, like, you know, being biased. Right. Like, you know, I you want to stick with your people, but, like, man, like, for once, just judge it. Let the right person win. Like, sure, he controlled the, uh, you know, the center, but I, I still did more damage and I dropped him a lot. And the thing is, also, what I did a lot was when my coach was like, you know, what my coach told me second round, we got to go in, and I was still using my movement, but I was letting more shots go. You know, I was, I was, I was, I wasn't, you know, doing just one at a time. I was, I was uh, setting up combinations to land certain big shots. You know, and and at times I, I pulled away from that, and at times you know I let loose and I was going. When I let loose, man, I was I was causing damage and I was dropping him with leg kicks and stuff. But when I was picking him apart, he was like, "Oh, he's just throwing one shot. Let me just jump in and lunge at him." And that's what he did. He would lunge in and you know, and the the biggest thing he did to me was the headbutt, and that's where that's what caused all the damage was the headbutt. So okay, so that's what caused that cut where they had the doctor come in and look at it. Yeah, it was the headbutt. Okay, that's and, what I thought. And I'm pretty sure they said that on the commentary during the fight. Yeah. You know, and it, it looked worse than it was because I'm sure when you're, you know, the judges, you know, I'm sure they were like, oh, man, like, you know, you see somebody bleeding bad. And now that you know it's a headbutt, that kind of helped a little bit. But the fact that you still see this person bleeding, they're like, man, he's getting beat up. <laughs> so I knew I had to step yeah. on the gas a little bit and, uh, you know, and, and overtake it. Yeah, well. I mean, I thought it was a very close fight, and I had to put my bias aside, you know, but I think as much as I could, I still had you win in 29-28. Like you said, you had done a lot of damage with the outside leg kicks in that fight where you had him tripped up, and you knocked him down a couple times. And this was a question, um, because thinking about leg kicks made me think of this. Ben wanted me to ask you, why do you wear uh, ankle wraps? 
during the uh, during your fights? Oh, little little extra support. You know, you you gotta you gotta protect. I mean, you gotta protect your money makers. You know, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, you 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 wrap your uh, you wrap your uh, your you wrap your your hands. You can wrap. You know, you can put a knee brace on if you're a little bit hurt, or you know what I mean. Like you can do all these things and. You know, I'm a kicker, so it's like, man, you know, I got, I got to protect, I got to protect my, uh, you know, I, I got to protect my, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of support. It's not like you can, you can't cast them with tape and all that. You know what I mean? Right. And he knew there was a reason for it. That was just a question that, um, in a previous conversation I had with him that I remember him mentioning it. So I wanted to bring it up since he wasn't able to be here tonight. But, uh, so. Well, after the fight, after those first two scorecards are read in here, 29-28 Gutierrez, and then 30-27 DeFretis, what's going through your mind at that point? Do you think that the third card is going to have your name on it and that you're going to be announced the winner? You know, a part of me was, like, a little bit, like, scared. The one thing that I did, uh, the, the one thing that I did find peace, and I was like, you know, judge it by what it is. Like, sure, you can... You can run as you can run in recklessly and, and and do that, but if you're running in recklessly, and you're controlling the center, but you're getting touched up. It's like it really nullifies. It's like if you take me down, I get back up. It kind of takes away from the takedown, you know. Yeah. So that's what I did. I feel like I feel like he was he was doing that, but I was making more damage. I was making more damage, and so um, with that, I was like, man, I think I secure the last round because like. I, I still, I still was touching him up pretty, pretty hard on the last round. Even though he was backing me up, I was landing the significant shots. And if you look at the the total, um, you know, like the the striking percentage and all that, and how many strikes were landed, mm-hmm. I think mine was like a ninety three percentage rate that I landed on him significant strikes. That means every wow. shot that I threw, whether it was a, uh, you know, a a full commitment shot or just setting something up. I would, you know, I was, I was like 90 or like 93% like on point. Wow. That's a crazy stat. (laughs) Yeah. And I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that until I looked on the internet and somebody else told me that too. But I, you know, so when I read the scorecard, the one thing that got me was like, man, they're, they're, they're Brazilian. He's Brazilian. Like, I hope they don't judge it by that, you know? Yeah. Well, ultimately, you know. All good things happened. You get the victory. And then during the post fight, um, use your platform to bring notice to the current custody battle with your son, Adrian. Uh, I was just going to ask you, is there any updates on that? No, on man. Just, okay. No, I'm, I'm still, I'm still fighting that battle. <laughs> gotcha. It's still been five months and uh, there's some, there's some evil people in this world. Yeah. So, but you know, I'm I'm praying on it, and uh, I'm doing what, I'm doing my part, you know. And uh, it's a slow process. I've accepted it that it it's not going to happen overnight. I really wish it would, but yeah. You know. Well, I'm praying for you, brother, and I really hope the best for you in that situation. I genuinely mean that. Thank you. All right. So, uh, last time we kind of did a like overview of your life. Uh, so this time I wanted to talk about specifically you as a fighter. Um and just kind of things that go on in your day-to-day life. So what does the typical day for you look like as a full-time fighter? I guess like today's a Tuesday. What's your typical Tuesday look like? Well, today I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting my family. So it's a little, little different. I'm, I'm relaxing right now, you know? Right. Um, but when I'm in Colorado, I mean, I, I wake up and uh, if we have practice in the morning uh, from 10 to noon, I go to practice come home or rest a little bit, eat, do, you know, run some little errands that I got to do. And then, uh, at four 30 or five o'clock, go be at, be at the gym, ready to roll for the pro practice for the team practice. Gotcha. And, and then, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I go to Landau performance and, uh, you know, for our strength and conditioning, man, we got the best strength conditioning coaches, you know, on the planet. So man, I, it's amazing. It's a, it's a very, good culture that that we have at factory x and and when all the teams you know when they execute everything perfectly man it, it's it's man like i said i'm blessed to be where i'm at it's, yeah. i'm enjoying the process 
Well, I see a lot about you guys from becoming friends with uh, Jordan Kurtz and seeing the whole comments from the peanut gallery thing that y'all have going on. So it's pretty cool kind of seeing like into y'all's lives a little bit and what goes on like in yeah, the man. process of it. That's, that's kind of a little new thing that started happening, but man, he's, Jordan's an awesome person, man. And if you, if you ever get to meet him man, he's just a down to earth person and he's just very, he's so humble and he's so eager to learn and, and, and just, you know, take in everything that goes into our lives. And man, luckily he's there to capture these moments, you know? Yeah. Now, another question that I had for you was what does your diet look like during fight camp? And what is the weight that you walk around at? It's for anybody that doesn't know you fight at Bantam weight, which is 135 pounds, but obviously you cut to that weight. So what's your walk around weight and what's the diet that you use during training to get down to 135? Like, I walk like 155, 160. Okay. And then um, just lean meat, like, you know, um, ground turkey, chicken, fish, salads. Uh, and then the, the portions get smaller and smaller, you know? <laughs> yeah. And after that, it's just, you know, gallons and gallons of water. Yeah. Now, was it? I'm pretty sure it was you that made the post about uh, you were in the hotel room and when your coaches had all this chocolate oh, in the room. Man. Yeah. <laughs> that was that funny. Was I felt bad for you, but <coughs> it made me laugh when I saw it. That was sad, man, because when he left, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Wow, <laughs> yeah. And I almost, I, almost, I almost fell for it, but I was like, nope, can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and then the final just quick question that I have for you was, is there any like mental exercises or rituals that you do that you're okay with sharing like before a fight, like kind of any particular habits or things that you just kind of like got to do to get yourself in the right place mentally? I need, I need, I need, a, I need some alone time. I need like, you know, usually from 10 to 30 minutes of just alone and just, just, I talk to myself, I pray, you know, I pray. And, um, you know, that's when the, 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 the switch kind of flips. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just go into this different, I become a different person. And, and I just, I have to, I have to for that night, you know? Yeah. That, like, you gotta I almost like distance myself from the world in a way. It's different, man. It's so hard to explain, it, you know, especially for people that don't know never been in that kind of fighting some people are like what does that mean and, and i don't get it you know it's the sport isn't for everybody so everyone's not going to get it and so you know but that's what i do i, I pray and uh and um i just I, I talk to myself you know it's like your own conscience it's like it's like you become one with yourself for that second and, and right um, time to go to, to battle gotcha well last and final question do you have any updates about any future fights or anything you can share with us? Because now that you just finished, uh, or your fight was on, what was it, August the, August the 11th? Was when you fought in August, way? August 10th, yeah. August 10th, um, yeah. I told him I, I'd like to fight before the end of the year is up. So. Okay. We just have to wait. Now it's the waiting game. Right. Well, I'm looking forward to watching you fight again. Again, thank you for coming on the show. For any of our listeners that are not following you on social media, where can they find you at? On, on on Instagram, you can find me on El Guapo MMA. Uh, Facebook, you can find me on uh, you know Chris Gutierrez. I got a fan page as well, athletes page. Uh, on on Twitter, it's C Gutierrez MMA. And um, yeah, man, just follow me there. And uh, I usually keep busy on there, and uh, you know I try to post something you know encouraging or you know fight related, and you know it's sometimes funny stuff, but. Uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody, man. I appreciate the love and support. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Chris. Thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right, guys, that wraps up episode number 24 of The Fight Addicts. Again, we want to say a special thank you to Chris Gutierrez for taking the time to discuss his life for all of us to be able to listen. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting app, be sure that you subscribe to the show. That way you don't miss any new content from us and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode today. If you're listening on YouTube, make sure that you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. That way you never miss hearing from us. Be sure to follow Chris on Instagram at L underscore Guapo underscore MMA 
and on Twitter at C Gutierrez MMA. As always, follow us on social media at The Fight Addicts and follow mine and Ben's personal Twitter accounts at TFA underscore Seth and at TFA underscore Ben. Thank you all so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And we will see y'all next time.